welcome Andrew Gross. Thanks again. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning. Well, I felt like I slept here last night. Um, how many of you guys were here last night? Oh, wow, wow, wow. I got to think of something new to say. Um, well, yesterday I got to be Steve Barry, so today I can, I can be myself. Um, and I thought what I would do is, um, is talk about a shift in my career. Um, in mid-career, which is, which is sort of a, a daunting task in publishing, and, um, and, and then maybe a couple of my newer books more specifically than I, than I did last night. Um, so if you had invited me here two years ago, um, you would have just sort of introduced me as someone who had a pretty good career writing um, what I would call suburban thrillers and defining that as, uh, as, as stories that are about um, upscale settings and personalities where you could sort of take a mirror and look at the main character and maybe see yourselves, um, you know, lives that are on a nice arc and then something happens to them, maybe, maybe the husband launders some money or, or makes a trade he shouldn't have or maybe the wife steps into a hotel room with a guy that she never should have done, and then all of a sudden everything changes, um, and their lives are put in peril. Um, usually the family, the kids are threatened, and, and the novel is them getting out of this pickle. Um, and, and my trademark was always that there was always some emotional resonance in it, which is what I like to write about. I mentioned yesterday that families have always intrigued me in the discord and disharmony in families, and then ultimately maybe the putting back together. Um, forgiveness and redemption are always emotions or qualities that I admire and like to weave into my stories. Um, so I had a pretty good career in this, um, but at some point I began to feel that I wanted to do something differently. Um, I, I guess... Uh, um, over time, I began to feel that I was pushing a boulder uphill um, on every book, trying to come up with new ways to entrap and then ultimately extricate my, my characters. And the predictability of the settings, the, um, the you know, everything is a formula a little bit. And, and, and I guess ultimately, our ability as a writer um, is is to try to make it that you don't perceive this. And, and you know, all of us, like Harlan Coben and, and, and Lee Child and, and down to people like me, I guess, um, you know, we're always sort of writing about the same characters, the same stories, and we just all try to conceal it in this, you know, in, in this veneer of, of that each book is different in a certain way. And, and to some degree, maybe it's that predictability that you guys want when you come to one of our books that you look forward to, either by character or, you know, when you, when you see Jack Reacher, you know what he's going to do in that book, and, and you know who he is. So you're, you're, you're coming to the book for the predictability. But to me, to me it, was, it was weighing me down a little bit creatively, and I wanted to write different books. I wanted to write books that were more atmospheric, I wanted to write books that were less plot-centric, um, a little deeper in character, where I could stay longer um, in, in the chapters and with characters. Um, the truth is, um, even having a bunch of bestsellers on my resume, I never felt that I was a good enough writer that if I broke my pattern, that people would continue to read me. And, and, of course, publishers always reinforce that in a way. Not that they don't tell you you're a good writer, but they want that predictability. Um, they want that, they, you know, I mean, you know, editors want to know what they're getting when they buy a book. Salesmen want to know what they're going to sell. Retailers want to know where they're going to position a book. So everything sort of fits keeping in that mold. But I wanted to do something differently. Like I said, write more atmospheric books. Um, books that were more like I like to read as opposed to the books that I 
wrote, and some of what I wrote was a product of, of spending you know, five or six books with Jim Patterson originally in my career, which ultimately defines you as an author. Um, even today, where my books are now getting all kinds of stars and publishers you know, weekly, and, and I'm on all these, suddenly on all of these end of the year top thriller lists, uh, um, but every review always says, you know, X Patterson co-writer. Um, <laughs> And you can't break away from it. But at the same time, what did I talk about last night? Except that. So I guess I'm, I'm guilty, too. So I, I felt that I was pushing this boulder uphill. And uh, I, I, you know, but it's hard to break away, because like I said, publishers don't want you to. When you, when you go to your publisher and you say, listen, I have a terrific idea for the next book. Instead of writing about Greenwich, Connecticut and tax fraud, um, I want to write a book about the Holocaust. Uh, and, 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 you know, your publisher is going to say this to you, Andy, incredible idea. I think you're just the man to do it. But just not on the next book, OK? Maybe a couple down the road, you know? And so ultimately, what happened? Um, I mentioned yesterday, for those here, that I had this long nine-book contract with HarperCollins. It came to an end. An idea stared me in the face. And then I said, basically, what the hell? And I let the boulder fall. And I decided that what I was going to do could not possibly be as risky as the original move I made to get into this business in the first place. So I decided to tell a story that was different, and not only in plot, but in the way that I told it and in, in how I wrote it than anything I had done before. And the idea that presented itself to me was the story of my father-in-law, who uh, came to this country in 1939 um, as a student. And uh, six months before the outbreak of the war from Warsaw, um, and he uh, never knew the fates of anyone in his family um, ever again. Um, they um, all perished. He was the only one to survive the war. And um, like a lot of survivors, he never spoke about his life before he came to the States because it was uh, filled with you know, too much conflict and, and, and emotionality. Um, my wife who was upstairs listening to Paula McLean now, uh, and she doesn't have to hear me, um, never even knew the names of her grandparents, never knew anything. She and her twin brother never knew anything about her family because he wouldn't talk about it. When I tried to talk to Nate about uh, some background for the book I was going to write, he would just wince. And, and, and basically put up his hands and say, I couldn't talk about it. Even the smallest details, like what kind of food would you have you know, on, a Saturday, on, on a Sunday, the Sabbath being Saturday, you know, and, 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 and you know, after, after temple, like what would you eat or, or how would you spend your day? He couldn't. Um, the, it just brought up too much pain. Now, um, in 1941, uh, when America got into the war, he enlisted in the army of his adopted country. And he, um, because of his facility with languages, he spoke several, was put into the OSS. And predictably, he never spoke about his experiences in the OSS either. So everything was a blank. But we knew that he carried this weight of this mantle of pain around with him. He was never a happy man. And his pain were, was caused by his memories. And so basically, I set out to write the book that he would have written if he could have spoken his own story. So as I mentioned last night, the, the one man is a story about uh, um, an, a, a, an escaped Polish Jew who was convinced to go back to Poland to the place where his parents were murdered by the Nazis in order to help smuggle out the one man that the Allies feel 
can win them the war, and that man is an atomic scientist, and the place where this scientist ends up is Auschwitz. Now, um, it was um, a, a difficult thing to write a story that um, was um, about a third set inside Auschwitz. Um, you know, for a Jew, it's kind of the holy grail of grief. Um, and certainly was a lot different than anything I had ever taken on before. It wasn't my goal to write the definitive book on Auschwitz or on the Holocaust. I, I felt that people who had written first-hand accounts had already done that much more compellingly than I was going to. But I thought that I had a different approach into it and um, um, because I was writing a thriller. And, and you know, it's a thriller in the sense that there is a ticking clock and a 36-hour window and high stakes. But it's a much more, um, it, it's a really a book about family and about this family that um, believes they are dead and then one person actually survives it. And it's a, it's a story about the camps. Um, but nowhere on the flap, this is a different book, but nowhere on the flap does it even mention Auschwitz because, you know, when you talk about Auschwitz, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a dark, somber conversation that suggests that, you know, there's no good endings, that there's, that there's nothing positive that will come of it. And certainly as far as Jews are concerned, we've read the books, we've gone to the museums, we've seen the movies, and why do we need one more to read one more thing about it? But the truth is, is that The One Man is a story of affirmation. It's a story of courage. It's a story of redemption. It's a story that has humor laced into it, as well as thrills. And I just didn't want people to think that, you know, that it, it, it was governed by the sort of predictability that comes when you read that something, you know, might have a connection to concentration camps. Um, it's a story of courage, and that's, that's what I, and sacrifice, which is what I wanted to write. Um, so um, the book came out. It actually, you know, it was a hard book to sell, I have to admit. Um, a lot of publishers would say things like, you know, when you go out to sell it, and coincidentally, I sold it as an outline. I mentioned yesterday that my first book, The Blue Zone, was sold as an outline. This book was sold as an outline, too, although a very, very thorough one, which would make you think you were reading an abridged version of the book, um, although I totally did change the ending in the writing. Um, so, so all outlines don't lend themselves to just sort of, you know, here it is and you write it out. I completely changed the ending at, at, at the end of the book in terms of who survived and who didn't. Um, but um, a lot of publishers thought, you know, and said, you know, gee, if Andy sticks to his knitting, I'd love to have him here, but um, not if he's going to make this change. And others maybe thought, you know, hey, this is a guy that writes sort of pulpy thrillers. Um, you know, who is he to be ta tackling the Holocaust? Um, so it was, a, it was a difficult book for me to sell. And, and frankly, where I thought I was going to have multiple people behind it, I really just had one or two publishers that, that decided that they wanted in on this. I think I ended up in the right place at St. Martin's. They were bullish on the subject, on, on, on what I was, on the project from the beginning. And the interesting thing is, um, it came out, and it, it to, to my real disappointment, didn't make the bestseller list. And I was pretty bummed by that, because many of my books had. Um, but it ended up, it's ended up being by far my number one selling book. It's had an incredibly long tail. And not only to some degree through the Jewish communities, um, which really have embraced the book and in, in ways that have made me so gratified, but it's just a great, thrilling, sort of unique book and continues to sell a year and a half out. Um, and and um, you know, it just has a long tail. So in the end, um, I accomplished exactly what I wanted to, to do from it. Now, somewhere in the writing of this book, um, I came across um, a story that struck me as just so intriguing and compelling in itself that I said, I may have to write this story too. 
and it's linked um, only by the, by the attempt uh, on the, of the Allies to withhold the atomic bomb from the Germans. And in research on the, uh, you know, the, the one man has a little bit of, uh, of science in it. And, and I actually was insisting that that science get put in there because I wanted people to know what this scientist knew in a proprietary way that was worth everybody risking their lives to get him out. And I thought it was important to pull the reader through that as well. And I do it kind of in an entertaining way more than a professorial and boring way. Um, but in researching that science, I came across another interesting event that some of you may know, but I really didn't have much familiarity with. And because of that, I said, I got to write this. And that's the story of how another one man basically kept the Nazis from um, producing heavy water in Germany, heavy water being a moderator that's used in the isotope separation process that is essential to the creation of an atomic bomb. Um, in, 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 you know, as early as like 1939, I mean, Germany was the center of atomic research in the world for a long time. And the only reason the Germans didn't end up with the atomic bomb before the United States did, and the Brits, is that they kicked all their Jews out. All the scientists were, were <laughs> kicked out and, and ended up in the United States, you know? Uh, if they rethought that, it would have been a, a, um, uh, of course, if they rethought their whole policy towards the Jews, things might have been different, too. Um, in any case, um, um, both, b on both sides of the Atlantic, there was a race to get the bomb. Now, now the race, uh, um, the, the Germans at some point sort of pulled themselves out of it because they were focused more into the V3 guided rocket missiles and what was called the London gun, which was, if you can believe it, this massive, I think it was like a 300-foot barrel that would shoot these 100-pound, 200-pound bombs um, across the channel, could shoot them, you know. And so they were into these um, uh, weapons that they thought would uh, bring, uh, bring England to its knees. Um, and then after um, they, they were, um, um, after their losses in Stalingrad, when the tide of the war began to turn, um, all of a sudden the atomic program became, you know, centralized, central again for them. So everybody was after this. And um, there's this one factory in Norway, in a remote part of Norway, that literally is impossible even to, to get to. Um, um, a factory that's on top of this 600-foot shelf of rock um, where literally if you threw, uh, you know, a, a uh, Norwegian fennig, I forget what they call, I don't even, kroner actually, off the edge, the first thing it would hit would be the river 600 feet below. That's how steep it was, um, totally unscalable um, in a remote section. And what they were producing was heavy water. And uh, um, at some point, uh, um, the, uh, the, well, when we first meet our hero in this book, um, whose name is Kurt Nordstrom, who was modeled af of a after a real life person named Newt Hakalud, um, he's coming into contact with a friend of his who's an engineer in this factory who smuggles out a piece of microfilm um, that shows that the Nazis are tripling, quadrupling their levels of heavy water, which can only mean one thing. They're aggressively going after um, their atomic research. And the more that they create, the more the allies think that they're ahead of them in the race. And this microfilm is put uh, into a, a tube of toothpaste, um, with the most valuable tube of toothpaste in Europe at that point. And um, the engineer says to, says to Kurt, someone has to take this to, to England and get it into the right hands. And they, uh, at, at first, sort of saying, no, it's not for me. He's convinced to do it. And uh, eventually, they say, well, look, we're Vikings. The best way to get to 
the best way to get to England is by sea, and we're Vikings, and where there were Vikings, there were always ships. And what they set out to do in the first chapter or two is hijack a Norwegian coastal steamer that, you know, clunkily goes up the coast, just dropping people off all the way from, from, from Oslo all the way up to, like, Kirkenes all the way on the top, and, and then back. And they take this steamer, and they make a beeline across the North Sea to get to England, Scotland, actually, and outrace. It's a very thrilling chapter where Messerschmitts are coming in to sink it, and there's a, you know, I won't give it away, but it's sort of thrilling to start the, start the story. And then eventually, he comes back to um, lead this mission to, um, um, to go after this factory. Now, I don't know if anyone's been watching the Olympics and watching the Nordic skiers, <laughs> but if you have, you get a sense of what this book is about and what the story is, is about. There's a, there's a, a mention in here of, a, of an adage, and it's, uh, that a, that a, it's a Norwegian adage that a true man goes as far as he possibly can, and then he goes twice as far. And that's the way that these men conducted themselves to eventually get landed on, uh, on, on the Hardanger Vida, which is this enormous plateau of ice and tundra, lifeless sort of you know, shelf of rock that's thousands of square miles where no one has ever been dropped by parachute. And these six men get on there. They brave a lot of inclement weather. And then they, they climb this shelf of rock, and they take on uh, a factory that's guarded by crack troops. And, um, and um, I, I guess history has said that the mission was successful. We know the end, how the war worked out. But, but describing it is a really, really thrilling thing. So this is an adventure. Um, in the, I guess in the, in the tradition of the Guns of Navarone or, or Where Eagles Dare or something like that, the old Alistair MacLean novels, um, where, where these big sort of sprawling World War II adventures with huge stakes, well, you know, this is, this is it. So I have a hero, and I think Nordstrom is one of those people, the women will certainly like him. He's definitely a guy you would like in your foxhole with him and, you know, <laughs> with you. Um, but, but um, you know, a good thriller also needs a villain. And in this case, I, I, I probably have two. Now, Nazis generally lend themselves to being easy villains, right? Um, you know, um, the, uh, the, I was going to go political again. I said the only person who doesn't feel that way seems to be our president. But, 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 but you know, in this case, my, my bad guy is not specifically a Nazi but someone who is part of the Norwegian secret police, which were kind of like the Gestapo um, in the Quisling government, as, as many people know the word Quisling, which has become a, a term for traitor, but there was a real person. He actually um, ran a coup and took over the, uh, the uh, kicked out the king and took over the Norwegian government and collaborated with the, with the Germans and his secret police was just as insidious as, as the uh, Gestapo was outside, you know, in, 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 in Europe, in other parts of Europe. Um, and my guy is, uh, is uh, someone who sits in the back of the class. He's known this guy Nordstrom since they were kids. He's, he, whereas Nordstrom, you know, I'm actually sitting here having a senior moment, and I'm blanking on the name of my own bad guy here. <laughs> And it's not coming to me. <laughs> Lund. His last name is Lund. Again, Dieter Lund. So, so um, see, I am old enough to have open heart surgery. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, but you know, as Nordstrom is someone who is athletic and, and popular and smart and knew all the answers, here's this Dieter Lund who sits in the back and isn't popular, always feels like an outcast, looks at Nordstrom with scorn his whole life. Um, and now, a few years later, he's in charge of the security of this region. And he begins to feel that his old nemesis has come back. And the only thing he can be coming back for is what they call the golden goose of that area, which is the heavy water that's being made by this factory. Um, 
And so uh, this is his adversary. It's very much a cat and mouse game. It's very much like Inspector Jovert in, in, in Les Miserables. Um, and eventually, of course, you know, the two have a great confrontation. Um, but this is my bad guy. And there's one other villain. And I'm actually going to read a little, if I can, just a page or two, because um, another character in this book, and a foreboding one, is the weather in Norway. Uh, the storms that come in and uh, um, you know, don't allow you know, uh, uh, people to parachute in, or when they do, just, just are just such foreboding things that it takes such incredible manhood to sort of persevere in these things. Um, and it's very much a, a character in the book. And I would like to read a little bit and give you a sense of what it's like. Um, and then I'll open the floor to questions and all. Um, let's see. Um, just to set the stage, this group of, um, of, of six commandos has just landed at night on the, um, um, on this, on the Vita. And when, when light hits, they have no idea where they are. Nothing is recognizable to them. They're supposed to meet three other commandos that have been there um, starving, literally, for a month uh, when their mission didn't work out. And they're supposed to meet up with them. And they don't even know which direction to go in. So, And of course, since I wrote this for an American audience, um, I had to include an American. And that is, in a fictional, that is a, a, a fictional part of this. So I've, I've put a, a yank uh, on this team who was part of the 10th Mountain Division and grew up in Colorado. And so for the American audiences, I've inserted this guy. And of course, he's kind of a faux Norwegian. The Norwegians tease him as he thinks coming from Colorado, he's lived in the mountains and seen the fierce storms. But they're all sort of saying, you, you don't know what you're in for when you see one. So. Um, um, let's see. Let me start it here. Um, they skied about two hours. Hard work with a 70-pound pack strapped on their backs, but soon they began to suspect that their bearings had been wrong. They were nowhere near Bjornsford, Nordstrom came to sense. The lake should have been in sight by now. They stood around and chewed a jerky strip and tried to get a fix. If we're not in Bjornsford, then where? Ronnenberg, one of the commandos, uh, asked. Striken? Striken? Let's hope not. That's almost 30 kilometers off, Nordstrom said with dejection. And look, he pointed eastward. The mountains that were in sunlight only a moment ago were suddenly covered in clouds. With the swiftness of a squall at sea rising up out of nowhere, the skies darkened and the winds kicked up. Well, it seems you're about to get your wish, Yank, Ronnenberg muttered. Button up. The wind seemed to sweep in the clouds, and in an instant they could feel the temperature plunge. There was no doubt a storm was coming in. They were miles from any shelter they knew of. This could last an hour or a couple of days. You never knew how long or how strong it would be. Which way, Ronenberg deferred to Nordstrom. One thing they all knew was that they couldn't stay there. There, they'd be at the mercy of nature. He checked the winds. Your guess is as good as mine. I say, continue east. East, into the teeth of it, Alf Pedersen questioned. The winds had now started to howl, even knocking Gutterson, that's the Yang's hood off, and snow was starting to swirl. We'll never outrun it, Nordstrom said, tightening the toggles of his hood. Button up, Yank, he turned to Gooderson. We're about to see firsthand if you were born to be a hillman. Within minutes, whatever hope they had that this was just a passing squall was dashed. The wind sharpened into icy gales, howling like sirens. Frozen snow hurled around like sand in the desert bit at their eyes. Large drifts piled up around their skis, making every step a task the weight of their packs on their backs bringing them to a virtual halt. Visibility became zero. Pull up your mask, Nordstrom said to Gutterson above the howl of the wind. Inside their hoods, they had only the narrowest exposed slit for sight. But they could see only an endless sea of white anyway. As the temperature dropped, the wind drove arrows of frozen snow into their eyes, clamping them shut, 
virtually blinding them. The only benefit of such a storm, though a small one, was that the blanket of blown snow would cover their tracks and eliminate any trace of them if the wrong people happened to pick up their presence. They leaned into it, pushing against the gales one step at a time. In minutes, each became covered in white. An hour of slow going passed. Nothing familiar appeared. Then two hours. They were only able to go about a kilometer. It was becoming eerily impossible to carry on. And Nordstrom knew that they were now completely lost. Worse, without shelter, he knew they'd have to dig in somewhere on the side of a slope with nature's fury raging all around. This was a bad one, it was becoming clear. And in this kind of storm, even the most experienced men could only hold out so long. But just finding such a sheltered spot was next to impossible, with the snow-swept gales battering them and the snow so thick you could barely see your hand in front of your own face. Come on, all of you, we have to go on, Ronenberg pushed them. But his eyes connected with Nordstrom's and betrayed an expression of concern, which Nordstrom rightly read as, we're in for a tough fight here. They trudged about another kilometer, almost to the point of giving up, when suddenly Peterson, who had assumed the lead at that stage, pointed ahead with joy. Look, you could barely hear his shout above the shrieking gales. It was a hut, a hunting cabin, almost entirely encased in a blanket of fresh snow. The winds blew so fiercely and visibility was so limited that they didn't come upon it as much as bump directly into it. Thank the trolls, Jens thrust his poles in the air triumphantly. Excuse my language. Fuck the trolls. Thank whatever beautiful son of a bitch happened to own this place, Hans Storhug said. He loosened the icy doorframe with an ax, pushed it open with his shoulder, and the seven of them tumbled inside. So that's kind of a sense of what kind of men were capable of doing this, this, this thing. And then, as I said, ultimately, um, and it does follow history, it falls on just Nordstrom to be the one individual person that through his own bravery um, stands up and, uh, and makes history fall on the right side. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and uh, open it up for any questions on the two books. I'll even talk about Steve Berry's books. I'm, I'm in a, <laughs> I can't really see any, but yes, yes, ma'am. I would like to know, what was your father-in-law's response mm -hmm. to The Last Man? Uh, uh, what was my father-in-law's response? I'll, I'll tell you both his response and an anecdote. By the time it came out, he was, he was pretty ill, and he died, short, he died before publication. Now, my wife was able to read a couple of the chapters that describe him um, in, in a way. And um, at some point, he just put up his hand and started to cry and said, stop. And he never got more than a couple of chapters in. Um, but it was an emotional moment between them. Now, I'll tell you a little anecdote of something that was, um, was a result of this. Um, after he died, my wife was cleaning out his cupboard. Um, his, his, uh, his wife had died a couple of years before. Um, and she came across something extraordinary. And that was this bundle of letters written in Polish that he had kept from anybody all these years that were written to him by his mother in the first year, 1939 to 1940, that he had come to this country. And no one knew any about them, and no one had any insight into what their grandmother was even like. And, and our neighbor in New York is Polish. And so we shot the letters up to her, and literally in a day, she translated them and sent them back because we were having uh, a memorial for him and my kids were able to sort of read the uh, anglicized versions of these letters at the memorial, which was very nice. But what was really interesting was what these letters showed. First of all, a couple of them were, um, um, they were written, there was a change of address. And originally, they were in an upscale part of, of, of Warsaw. And then on Google Earth, we could see that the new address was actually inside the Warsaw ghetto. So they had been moved there as a family. Secondly, a couple of them had stamps of swastikas on them. 
And we assumed that those were um, sensors who had, uh, had approved whatever was in it. And the letters showed this modern, funny, caring, you know, likable woman who was my wife's grandmother, who we had, had, you know, she had had no insight, her name was Regina, no insight into ever before. And she kept on saying in the letters, Nathan, how is life in America? Why have you not written us? We love you, we miss you. How are things there? Are you okay? Can you let us know? Letter after letter, please write us. We don't hear from you. Do you get our letters? And ultimately, it became clear that while she was writing him, and I'm sure he was writing back, those letters were never delivered. And who knows what fate was in store for them. And so we began to realize that the sadness that he had had his whole life, this sort of mantle of grief that he carried, was likely the fact that he knew his parents died never hearing from him, never knowing if he loved them or if he had, you know, if he had written them. And that's a huge and poignant burden to bear, you know, and something he, so I think in some way, um, the book helped to solve um, the, 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 you know, a bit of the mystery of his life uh, through that story. Well, that was sort of a Paul, you know. <laughs> Someone else? Yes, who's, who's that? Yes, ma'am. Could you share with us what happened when you left um, the last thing I business with your family? Can I share what happened when I left the Leslie Fay business with my family? Um, well, I know what I was feeling. I don't know what they were feeling. <laughs> um, well, here's the deal, you know. You know, I, I, I shared a personal story yesterday for people who weren't here that I used to be in the apparel business and that my family's company was called Leslie Fay, which um, was uh, at one point a, you know, a billion dollar uh, diversified apparel company and at some point I found myself on the outside of it. And, uh, you know, I, at first it was filled with a lot of conflict. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was a tough moment for our family because my last name was always sort of, you know, he, one day he's going to run this company, you know, it was always assumed. And, and um, suddenly I was not, and suddenly I was on the outs. Um, I had a lot of resentment from it, you know, because it was a bit of a battle. Um, and it took a while to, over, to, to sort of get past that. And, uh, you know, it was filled with a lot of uh, family and office politics. So I don't know what other people were feeling. I mean, on a personal level, I sort of felt that I was pushed out. And I'm sure they were feeling that I, you know, dug my own grave or whatever, whatever the right expression was. Um, subsequently, um, I think everyone is delighted. Um, I mean, this is not new news. This is now 20 years into it of, of the career path that I've taken and how things have worked out for me. And as it happened, not long after I left, Leslie Fay underwent a uh, financial scandal and um, to, to, for which the CFO ended up spending 20 years in Allentown prison for an overstatement, a substantial overstatement of income. The stock which I sold when I left at $23 and, and a quarter ended up going to a quarter and, you know, it was, um, and, and the company is no longer in existence and hasn't been for a while. So, um, you know, lots of things happened. I mean, you know, where would life be if I was still in that company? I, you know, I, I mean, who knows where you'd be? So everybody sort of follows the path they were meant to follow, is I guess the way I look at it, so. Yes? Oh, you got good eyes. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the research process, and specifically from beginning to end, how long Right, right. Um, the whole research side of it. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm, I'm uh, by contract uh, um, paid to write a book a year, so I managed to do that. Um, 
And, and uh, I also outline very heavily. I talked a little about that yesterday. I do a lot of my plotting. Uh, my outlining process is my agent for plotting the book. It's kind of like playing chess with yourself, where you're just sitting at your computer and sort of writing out where you think a book is going, um, staying you know, 10 moves ahead of yourself. Um, and and so, so I do a lot of my research in the outlining process. Now, the only researcher I have on staff um, um, has uh, um, white fur and four legs and uh, <laughs> shares my office with me. Um, I, you know, I like, to, I like to read primary sources as best I can. They're, they're not hard to get today. The internet, of course, you know, is a very capable tool for, for, all, for finding this. Um, obviously, you do some geographic scene setting and you go places and get the feel of it. But I, I, I want, I mentioned yesterday that it's my philosophy that I want my books, I don't want my books to be so filled with information that it's as if I'm trying to convince you that I'm an expert in this. I want them to just be filled with enough information or, or sense of place that I convince you that the scene is real, you know, you the reader. So um, I, I, I do it myself. I mean, I guess when it came to the one man, I read eight firsthand accounts of being in the camps. I read books on, you know, Roosevelt and, and, and um, uh, which, which is a factor in the book. Um, read books on atomic science. One of the great books is Richard Rhodes, The Making of an Atomic Bomb. If anyone happens to have read that, it's actually one of the great books I've ever read. Not that much science in it, but in just an incredible, incredible history of science. Um, you know, I mean, you, you just read, and then you're trying to take away the bits of things that you feel inform your characters or inform your setting. So, you know, I usually, now, now I'm writing a book now. I, I finished it. I'm in the editing. I'm turning it in for the second time, I think. Um, and it's, uh, it's a book that takes place in 1905 and goes through 1935. And it uh, basically follows um, a Jewish garment entrepreneur that rises from the streets of the Lower East Side to become a successful young you know, uh, a garment guy. But he ends up um, going face to head to head against the head of Murder Incorporated, which was the Jewish mafia then, who have taken control of the unions. And um, um, so it's really this battle between you know, an, an everyman kind of a hero and, and this uh, nasty uh, uh, murderer, um, and, and, uh, and sort of follows the growth of the women's clothing business in New York in the early, in the 20s and 30s. And like there, I mean, I'm still actually reading books on it and still even in the editing process inserting stuff that I think you know, would just make the book a little richer. So, but once you turn it in, you know, you're done. So it's really all a question to me of not amassing information and not throwing this on the reader, but just sort of editing the types of information that make something give you the real feel. I mean, I'm really proud in this book, for instance. I mean, writing about Eastern European Jews is a layup for me, because I come from that. Um, I know the humor. I know the... The, the, you know, the, I know the stories, I know the backgrounds, you know. I, I don't want to say it was easy, but it's, it, the tradition is familiar to me. You know, I, I once spent about 10 months in Norway when I was uh, graduated college, but really, I mean, I know nothing about the Scandinavian culture. And making you read this, and, and I think it's happened, and, and sort of even getting the folk stories and the, and the, and, and the humor right to the point where you can read this and feel that you've just now lived comfortably in, in, a, in, 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 the Norwe in Norwegian families in the sense of how Norwegians see life seamlessly, that was actually something I take a lot of pride in. And all that is is really sort of immersing yourself in that tradition and that stuff and reading Ibsen and just picking stuff out, whatever you can pick out that makes it seem like you know what you're talking about. Yes. Oh. Um, how did Steve, How did Steve and I? Well, we're in the same trade. We go. You know, we're we're part of the 
same trade shows and all. And uh, uh, I think he liked my contract with uh, my, uh, that my agent got so much that he, he, uh, he, he now is with the same agent, and he got a lot better one. So <laughs> um, I've known he and his wife for, 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 you know, for a bunch. We've actually stayed with them and at their place in Florida. And uh, a lot of the thriller writers, you know, I mean, we sit and we're by ourselves the whole time for, in the year. And so occasionally we come out and who else do you talk to? When I was in business, I was in this group, I don't know if anyone knows it here, called YPO, which was Young Presidents Organization, where, you know, I remember when I was recruited, someone said to me, like, who do you, who can you talk to? You're, you know, you're, you're, you're running a company, so you know who is it you can share with, and here's a group of people you can share with. So the same thing kind of applies. Who else can you really talk to about this stuff but another writer? And basically, we all sit around and complain about our publishers all day. You know, <laughs> that's what any any author does. And you know, yes. I, I want to know who, if anyone, inspired you when you were a student, either elementary, high school, or college. Was there a teacher or a coach or a colleague or an adult in your life, older than you, who, who listened in a way that gave you the strength to become the writer that you are? Yes, and, but maybe differently than you're conceiving it. Not an educator. Um, um, without sharing too much about life, I, I come from a lot of divorces. My mom and I come from 10 divorces between my mom and my, my five apiece my mother and father. And I had one person who got me through it in such a way that he became the hero of, uh, and the patriarch of my life, and that was my grandfather. And he was a successful guy and started the Leslie Fay Company. But when I was a kid, um, he was up at my apartment almost every day on his way home from work, even for five or 10 minutes, just to. Uh, you know, just to sort of check in and, you know, be a part of my life. He also taught me, you know, he had this saying that was sort of couched in, in um, he never went past the sixth grade. So while he had a lot of wisdom, he, he wasn't bookish wisdom, but he always said, you can do anything you want in life if you want it badly enough, if you want to commit to it badly enough. And I used that as my mantra when I made a change of career um, from being in the clothing business to being a writer, where you can only imagine that my resume didn't support that. It's hard enough to get published when you have a resume that backs up that you know what you're talking about. When you put on that you've been running sports apparel companies, nobody takes you very seriously. Um, the book I just finished um, is his story to a large degree. And it was an emotional thing for me to write it. It's a book I've wanted to write for many, many years. And I couldn't figure out if I wanted to write it as a family memoir, because some of the stories are really larger than life in it. Or because I get paid to write thrillers, to do it as a thriller, which I was concerned uh, would uh, demean the story a little bit. Um, ultimately, I wrote it as a thriller. <laughs> um, and hopefully, I've carried. But, but um, I, I've done it in such a way that his voice comes out um, remarkably through it. So to me, it honors my grandfather. So you know, maybe not the intellectual um, um, you know, giant in terms of uh, my own career, but certainly in terms of character, yes. Yes? Do you uh, pour your whole heart and soul into your book you're writing right now before you begin to think about the next book? And if so, how much time you take off, and what inspires you for the title of the next book or the? Yeah, she. She. she uh, the question is, uh, do I put my heart and soul 100% into the book I'm writing, and then you know wait until I pass it along to start the next one? And the answer for me is yes. Now, you know, Mr. Patterson doesn't feel that way. I mean, he's got a million projects that he's juggling concurrently. Um, I'm, not that, I'm not that good. I said yesterday that I used to be a pretty good person at uh, multitasking, but I might now be the worst person in the world in terms of that. And I, I put myself 110% into each book. And, and I might have an idea what I want to work on, but I never flesh those ideas out. I never get past that um, until I turn a book in. And 
and that's kind of where I am now. I mean, I'm, 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 um, you know, really sort of, you know, starting to figure out what I want to do next. And that's always kind of a freakish time because, I mean, there's nothing that creates writer paranoia than I don't know what I'm going to work on next, you know. And while Patterson may have ten ideas that he can, you know, bring out in a year, I pray for one. And, and it's a little more difficult now when you're writing these historically set books um, because um, it's not like you have a main character and all you need is a crime. You have a main character, you have a setting, all you got to do is plug a new crime in, you know, and some backstory. Um, it, you know, I have to start from scratch and find these sort of resonant situations. And the other commitment I made for myself is I only want to write books at this point that are meaningful books to me. So The One Man was an incredibly um, meaningful book for me because it not only followed my wife's family a little bit, but it really built on the Jewish tradition. I feel like I made a little contribution to it. The book that uh, I just turned in was an, an important book for me because it was um, um, you know, a family story to some degree. This book really deals in sacrifice, redemption, um, of selflessness, selflessness, which are important things to me. So it, it, I only want to write stories that are important, and that sort of boxes me in a little bit also. Do we have time? Oh, my original book, Hydra, unpublished, still sitting around. I threaten, every once in a while, I threaten to bring it out to my agent, and he says, uh, not the next book, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one more if... Uh, and if not, I thank. Oh, OK. One more. Yep. I'm just curious if you ever consider writing a book based on the letters that you found uh, from your father. Well, um, I feel like I wrote that book in terms of the letter. I feel like, you know, I, I can't say, but, but actually, that would be the kind of thing that usually triggers me into, into, into building a story. So you're 100% you're right in terms of using that as maybe way in. I, I guess I hadn't really thought about it specifically, but maybe now that you bring it up, I'll, I mean, you know, it's amazing how things, my wife knows better than anyone, it's amazing how things find their way into books, you know, especially when you're familiar with, uh, you know, with the life and when things are happening. So thank you very much for another chance to talk to you about this.